Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, I'm delighted to invite you here to this very, very special event at the Graduate Institute with uh, the president of uh, Uruguay, Dr. Tabare Vasquez, who is going to speak with, uh, to us on the importance of the addressing the non-communicable diseases with a special focus also on the experience of uh, Uruguay in relation to tobacco. Mr. President, we are very, very honored that you are here with us and would like to thank you very much for making this time available. We'd like to uh, welcome all of you, but uh, we are also particularly happy today that uh, Dr. Tedros, the Director General-Elect of the WHO, is here with us as well. He just uh, reminded us that he knows this room, and some of you were perhaps here as well, uh, when the candidates uh, for Director General discussed here at the Graduate Institute, and that too was a, a very special event and uh, honor for us. The uh, focus uh, of today is uh, the non-communicable diseases, the multi-sectoral action that's necessary, and many of you know two dimensions that we always speak about. One is that health should have highest priority for government, and what more can we expect than the president of a country, who in this case is also a medical doctor, to stand up for health, to fight for health, and in this case, part of it was really fighting for health, not just saying uh, a nice words about health. The second link of uh, beyond you know, making health part of uh, government policy at the highest level to put health on the political agenda is, of course, human rights and the human right to health. And the president uh, comes to us from a speech at uh, the Human Rights Council. And uh, of course, as you know, the World Health Organization stands for the right to health. And increasingly, we see the many dimensions that the right to health has in terms also of non-communicable diseases and government policies. We have seen the right to health in relation to the social determinants of health. We have seen it in relation to the right to universal access to universal health coverage. But increasingly, we are understanding better the right dimensions of uh, the fight against non-communicable diseases. And this, I believe, is a big challenge also in view of the upcoming big conference in Montevideo that uh, the president will also speak to us about, and of course the deliberations next year uh, at the UN General Assembly on NCDs. So uh, NCDs is an agenda since 2011, since it was discussed at the UN General Assembly, that has moved forward, that increasingly is gaining strength, that is gaining new dimensions of how we understand and speak about non-communicable diseases and uh, the other agendas that we link it to. After the president has spoken to us, uh, we will be joined uh, by uh, two discussants, by uh, Douglas Betcher, who, uh, will, uh, who heads the uh, program on non-communicable diseases at the WHO, and uh, by Professor Thomas Zeltner, who was the former director of the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health, but who is known to you uh, in his work for WHO, also in taking uh, the agenda to fight tobacco forward. And we will ask them about some of their experience in this context. So we are delighted that you are here with us. Uh, you have seen uh, that uh, we have interpretation into and from Spanish. So I hope uh, all of you have uh, taken the instruments that you need for this. And uh, it is now my very, very great pleasure to ask the President uh, of Uruguay to come and address us. Please, Mr. President.
Good morning for all of you. And thank you so much to the Institute for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. And say this, I would like to speak in my mother language, the Spanish. Las enfermedades crónicas no transmisibles, como ustedes saben muy bien, constituyen un enorme desafío de políticas públicas para todos los gobiernos. Porque teniendo en cuenta el impacto humano, el impacto humanitario que tienen estas enfermedades sobre quien la padece, sobre su familia, sobre su entorno social y laboral, tienen también un enorme impacto económico y social para los países y en particular para los países subdesarrollados, algunos de los cuales están luchando contra las enfermedades infecciosas, sida, tuberculosis, malaria, cólera, etcétera, y a estas patologías en este mundo moderno se están agregando para esos países las enfermedades crónicas no transmisibles. Y el costo que tienen la atención de estas enfermedades, la atención de las invalideces que las mismas ocasionan, es muy alto, es un impacto muy alto para la economía de estos países. Cuando estas enfermedades pueden ser evitadas por la prevención y por la educación y mucho del dinero que se destina para atender estas enfermedades y sus consecuencias, los gobiernos de estos países podrían destinar estos dineros para mejorar la vivienda, para mejorar la educación, para mejorar niveles de sistemas de salud que tienen sin duda eh, mucho para mejorar en estos tiempos. Por estas consideraciones... Sí. Bueno. Sorry. Y de modern technology. Good. Sí, gracias. Bien. Con so, with these considerations, which we've just covered, we can look at the real importance and significance that we have when our governments become aware of the same and start carrying out political action to deal with this epidemic that humanity faces. More than two-thirds of morb mort morbidity and mortality are caused by these chronic uh, NCDs, as you are very well aware. And we sincerely believe that we need to coordinate and give coherence to the policies that the various governments are currently using to tackle these diseases. And so with the WHO, the government of Uruguay will be holding in October in Montevideo this meeting, the global WHO conference on non-communicable diseases. And this is something that we would very much welcome you to. So within this context of chronic non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory, chronic respiratory diseases, uh, degenerative uh, diseases, which are brought about by uh, factors that you are all well aware of, I would like to set aside so I can refer to a specific subject to which is that of cancer and the role that tobacco smoking plays in these illnesses. 
so we will present this is what I was just covering so we will present three or four quick chapters uh, because you're probably all fully aware of this uh, matters such as the definition of tobacco smoking its epidemiology the issue as a global health problem. The world has never seen a pandemic uh, as brutal as tobacco smoking. What public policies uh, against tobacco control have we used in Uruguay? What results have we obtained? And the dispute that we had with Philip Morris, which has just been dealt with through a uh, World Bank tribunal and they found Uruguay completely in the right because Uruguay defended the case that uh, Philip Morris's right to trade came below that of the right to life and health and any government has the responsibility to defend the health of their citizens. And so now we're looking towards the future. The WHO defines tobacco smoking as a chronic addictive disease which evolves with relapses. People make many attempts to give up smoking and sadly relapses are standard. Nicotine is very addictive, perhaps even more so than other psychotropic drugs. And it's very difficult for a smoker to give up. That doesn't mean we should uh, belittle or treat badly smokers, but we have to work very hard to help them give up that habit. And nicotine is the substance which is responsible for the addiction by acting on the central nervous system. It is one of the most addictive drugs specialists say that it's even more addictive than cocaine and heroin. Its history is it uh, originates uh, from America and it was used for ritual consumption for thousands of years. Initially tobacco was not inhalable. They were hand produced and they had a high alkaline content which did not allow the consumer to inhale the tobacco, it was not possible to do so. But industrialization of tobacco through the curing of leaves and the addition of sugars changes the acidity level of tobacco smoke and makes it something which can be inhaled. So at the starting point of this phenomenon, we see the development uh, on a global level of a massive consumption of tobacco. And here you can see the historic development from 1900 on of the consumption of cigarettes in the United States of America. The first advertising for tobacco was on the Camel brand around 1910 or so, more than 100 years ago. Then when some issues started to appear related to the consumption of tobacco, the industry put in filters on cigarettes. First evidence emerged that smoking could uh, lead to cancer emerged around the mid 20th century and a first report from the uh, US uh, Surgeon General in 1960 which showed that the damage that the consumption of uh, cigarettes uh, and tobacco could bring about not only affecting cancer but also cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. The tobacco industry knew early or was aware early of the damage that this product uh, did to their own customers. But they worked very hard on hiding this from public. 
opinion. They hid it, and they developed a wide range of uh, advertising, encouraging people, in particular young people, to consume tobacco. <coughs> and um, if you can all no doubt remember the Philip Morris uh, Marlborough adverts where uh, on the TV we'd see the starry sky at night with the cowboys who were strong and virile with the stock and smoking or playing the guitar and smoking and they were wonderful healthy specimens. The two actors who were in that advertising, both smokers, both died of lung cancer. The tobacco industry is the only industry which kills its own customers. And it needs to keep recruiting. Where do they do that? They go to the next generation, the young, to keep having customers. But as uh, all of the pathologies linked to tobacco started to appear, there was a reduction in smoking, particularly amongst men, not so much in women. There were many trials in various parts of the world until the final one, the, the recent one between Philip Morris and Uruguay, came out in favor of health and defending life. But the link uh, to uh, lung cancer was not always like that. There's a 1912 pu publication which said clearly that at that time lung cancer was a rare disease. However, today, lung cancer is the one which kills the most number of people, in particular men, but the, uh, the rate of prevalence of <coughs> lung cancer is also having an effect on women. If you look at the, so we can see the impact of a negative product and how it changed the opinion in medical circles in it became a serious scourge for humanity from something that was considered very small because it's one of the cancers that is least curable and it could be easily preventable. That's the paradox. We could avoid, just by not smoking, an enormous quantity of lung cancers. So we are facing an industrially produced epidemic and this graph shows you the virtually parallel lines and the same trends, how from 1900 onwards uh, we saw the increase in cigarette consumption and with a slight delay because as you know uh, we have to have a delay between the uh, cancer, cancerigenous uh, agent uh, carcinogen uh, acting and then the growth of impact of cancer. So we can see it's slightly behind, but it's there. And the WHO defined the various stages, the epidemic model for tobacco, where we can see how, first of all, we see an increase in the percentage of male smoke smokers, that's on the furthest left. Then we see later the increase amongst female smokers and then in the two lines on the right we can see how lung cancer increased among men uh, it stabilized and then there was a decrease but the cancer of female lung cancers is increasing it's continuing to increase we haven't yet seen the impact of education to stop women smoking. There's a dramatic fact which was seen in the United States of America, how women changed in terms of the type of cancers they had. At the beginning of the 20th century, the cancer which caused the most deaths amongst women in the USA was uh, breast cancer. Women start smoking in the 1920s, 
And at the end of the 20th century, breast cancer amongst women, uh, breast cancer in women has been equaled almost by lung cancer. And before, lung cancer was virtually unknown in women. And apart from the whole human aspect of this issue, which is of most concern and for which we need to really work, there is a socio-economic cost, which is very significant for countries, as I said at the beginning. There are myths that exist that states receive economic benefit from tobacco smoking because of income from tobacco taxation. But the World Bank in 1999 clearly defines the fact that if tobacco smoking is eliminated, there will not be economic losses, but many countries will profit. Why is that? That's because more is spent on treating the diseases and the social and health impacts of tobacco consumption than uh, the income received from tobacco taxation. When the economist understood that the cost of tobacco smoking were higher than the income from tobacco taxation, that's when we started to see the real fight against smoking. And states started to understand that there were also economic reasons beyond the human reasons to fight this pandemic. Now, fighting against this uh, pandemic means fighting against the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry has no reservations on uh, encouraging tobacco consumption when they're as aware as they are of the damage it causes, knowing they're going to bring about the death of many of their customers. <coughs> and this slide <coughs> shows you the uh, GDP of countries in my region in Latin America, such as Jamaica, Bolivia, Ecuador, Guatemala, Costa Rica, and Uruguay. And then we compare it to the capital and the let's call it uh, the GDP of Philip Morris. So if we add up the GDP of these countries, they still have less capital than the tobacco industry, in this case, Philip Morris. And that's huge because the economic lobbying power that Philip Morris has is enormous. And this led to the fact that many countries didn't dare to move forward on working in promoting the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control because they were afraid that Philip Morris could attack them for damage to commercial losses. So when we took the decision to take the tobacco industry head on and smoking head on, we're a very small country with 3.5 million inhabitants. The internal market uh, is very small in Uruguay. When we took these measures, Philip Morris took the measure of taking us to the dispute settlement uh, center of the World Bank not because of the interests of Philip Morris in Uruguay's market, it's a very small market, but because the real interest for Philip Morris was to harm a small country so that other countries who hadn't yet taken measures wouldn't do so through fear and would not tackle tobacco consumption. And Philip Morris argued that a bilateral agreement between Uruguay and Switzerland uh, for the protection. And that's where they put forward the dispute. But Uruguay said that the right to life and the right to health are above the right to trade. 
and it is the responsibility of all governments, above all, to defend the life and health of their populations. This uh, case uh, lasted three, four years. And finally, in July last year, the tribunal, showing and honoring its honesty, its professional attitude, gave full responsibility to the Republic of Uruguay. And I think this is a very good example for other countries to follow the path we undertook, not because we want to show we're any better, but because we need to raise awareness on a global level of the dangers of uh, tobacco smoking, not just in terms of the pathology, but all of the cancers, but all other types of path pathologies. I'm going to move forward. This is well known. Here you can see, in my country, the incidence and mortality of uh, cancers in men. Second, you can see we have lung cancer. First, it is prostate cancer that has an incidence of more than 60% and mortality of 20%, 21%. But lung cancer has 48% incidence and mortality of 45%. Lung cancer isn't cured, but it can be avoided. And that's the dramatic part of this. That's what is so dramatic. But what's happening now amongst women? The first place uh, amongst women of cancers is breast cancer with a very high incidence and a relatively low mortality. But then we see a growth in lung cancer. It's now in fourth place. And you're going to see, we see the same as in men. Mortality is virtually the same as uh, the incidence. It's one of the cancers that's least curable, and it's the cancer cancer that could have most be avoided just simply by not smoking. And this requires government commitments which are deep and really working to fight smoking. So what public policies did we develop in Uruguay? I'm going to go through this very quickly because no doubt you know them all. They're all in line with that which was set out by the WHO in the fight against tobacco within the framework convention and uh, in developing the um, FCTC, there was a process uh, to prepare for its implementation. The um, WHO uh, Convention on Tobacco Control came into force on the 27th of February 2005, a few days before we took government for the first time in Uruguay. And we significantly increased the price and taxes on tobacco, including rolling tobacco. This is uh, smoked a great, uh, a great deal by people in the countryside and rural areas. And uh, they were brought to the same level of pricing as cigarettes. So what did the tobacco company say then? They said that in increasing the cost of cigarettes through taxes, we were going to have an increase in contraband an increase in illicit tobacco. And that's an argument they use throughout the world. But if we take the necessary measures to control contraband with a serious commitment by every government, you can see what happened in my country. Overall consumption of tobacco fell because legal tobacco consumption fell and illegal tobacco stayed on a level. It didn't increase as the tobacco industry tried to argue. In Uruguay, we applied a closed 
places policy, which would be 100% free from tobacco smoke without any exceptions. And thus, uh, Uruguay became the first country in the Americas to achieve that, to become a smoke-free country. There's a law against the use of tobacco in closed public places with a fine, which first of all was applied to the person that was smoking, and then it now is applied to the business that allows smoking in its establishments. And there are fines for all public or private establishments that violate regulations on 100% smoke-free areas. We placed health warnings with images on cigarette packets. In 2010, we covered 80% of the total surface of the cigarette packs, and that made Uruguay the first country in the world to apply this measure. We also applied partial regulation of publicity, promotion, and sponsorship Publicity was banned with the exception of points of sale where it was allowed but only with an obligation to place 50% of publicity there against tobacco. We also banned misleading terms and in 2010 we banned the various presentations of the same, bra same brand. We prohibited the marketing of electronic cigarettes through the presidential decree of the 23rd of November 2009. And we continued with the policy that had started in 2004 through the National Resources Fund to assist with smoking cessation and it was extended to the primary level of care, another area we're pioneers in. In 2012, the Ministry of Health launched a public awareness campaign. And in 2013, along with the Honorary Commission Against Cancer, another campaign for information which was targeted at women informed them about the damage caused by tobacco, not just to their lungs, and not only and seriously damage to fetuses in pregnant women, but also the damage to skin and the aesthetics of women. And on the 8th of July 2014, Parliament passed a law unanimously through all the political parties represented there, both the party in government and the opposition parties. We passed the law which fully prohibits publicity, sponsorship, patronage and exhibition of tobacco products at the points of sale with no exceptions. And what happened? There was a 90% reduction of the level of air pollution in closed places and this placed Uruguay second in ranking in best air, indoor air quality which was uh, measured by Yale University. This is not something that we've made up in our country. This is a controlled test from a prestigious American university. Now, in terms of the impact on prevalence, we reduced consumption in adults by from 32% in 2006 to 23% in 2011. And today, we have a prevalence of 8%. In young people attending school, prevalence went from 30% in 2004 to 9% in 2014. And amongst doctors, sadly we have to talk about doctors who smoke, amongst doctors it fell from 27% in 2001 to 9.8% in 2011. This was measured by the Pan American Health Organization. It's not uh, data from the national government. And here you can see the dramatic fall of tobacco consumption in my country in young people among, from the 13 to 17 year age range, from 27% in 2005 to 9% in 2014. There was uh, coordination of work. 
The smoking ban led to a reduction due to acute myocardial infection in the hospitals. Half, it's a very small country, half the population is based in Montevideo and the rest are mainly in the metropolitan area. There are few hospital centers and it's very easy to measure the statistics and the incidence of uh, hospitalization for this pathology. The reduction was 22%. That reduction was abrupt and it has been maintained. And there's no other explanation than that it was produced by a reduction in people's exposure to the smoke from tobacco. Now, in terms of sale of cigarettes, there was a stain drop until 2011 when we saw a slight increase, which coincided with an increase in household income in Uruguay. At the same time as being an addictive product, uh, despite the reduction of the uh, percentage of consumers and of sales, the state of Uruguay collected significantly more due to tobacco taxes because we increased the taxes on tobacco. In 2004, we collected $84 million a year. And in 2011, after increasing taxes at two points, we collected $318 million. And uh, Uruguay has been earning and winning in many things, the health of its people and better living conditions, in prestige, in having achieved in this fight against tobacco. But also, we've been earning and winning some hundred million dollars a year through the tobacco taxation policy. So this, uh, we think that the uh, dispute with Philip Morris had a boomerang effect on the tobacco industry. And today there are many countries in the Latin American region which are putting into place measures, the same measures that Uruguay applied. Now, when we look at the future, we're working for plain packaging, which will be taking place this semester in my country, this six months. There's also the uh, ban of smoking close to education centers, even in the street, and close to hospitals. Because sadly, in my country, we can still see healthcare staff, including doctors who can't smoke indoors in the hospital, they go out and smoke in the street. And it's really sad to see our colleagues and the nursing staff dressed in white smoking in the street. We're going to be setting out bans so that at least a 200 meter area around schools and hospitals will be smoke free. So to conclude, I would like once more to invite you to this task, which uh, with the WHO we will be carrying out and holding in our country in October. You will be very, very welcome at the conference. I'd like to thank most deeply, first of all, the opportunity that I've been given by this institute to come here and speak. And secondly, I'd like to thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I think, and your applause shows this, uh, we would like to really congratulate you on the fantastic political effort that uh, Uruguay as a country, but you as an individual have taken to address this issue. And it shows what a difference it makes if one really moves to create the political determinants of health, political determinants that promote health, and those political determinants that allow us to address the commercial determinants of health. 
Thank you very much. Could I ask the other discussants to please come up and, and join us? I'd like to uh, start the uh, commentaries, or I would say some additional background information, actually, uh, because usually a strong political push like this needs many supporters, both in the country and outside of the country. And some of you might have been wondering, what role did WHO play in this, if Uruguay uh, has uh, a case uh, at uh, the world uh, at the uh, so uh, what was the role of WHO in the Uruguay case Doug so uh, WHO was very uh, shocked to see the level of intimidation of Philip Morris in trying to intimidate uh, Uruguay to back off their legislation which was completely completely in line with their obligations under the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uruguay was one of the first parties to the uh, treaty. And at a systemic level, at a global level, we were particularly worried what implications this would have for our, our public health work and regulation beyond even tobacco control. So WHO, in collaboration with the uh, Secretariat for the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, took an unprecedented step. This was the first time that WHO submitted an amicus curiae brief, which is a fancy legal term for a legal testimony, uh, to the uh, uh, arbitration tribunal um, at the uh, World Bank. And that, um, that uh, amicus brief outlined, first of all, the deadly effects, the global burden of disease caused by tobacco use, which the president has outlined very, very excellently then outline the key international measures at the international level, policies that countries should take to counteract the tobacco epidemic, particularly the full implementation of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and then outlined the gold standard evidence from around the world which would support the packaging and labeling measures which uh, were uh, instituted um, by, the, uh, by the government of Uruguay. And this is a real David and Goliath story. And uh, where David, uh, David won and Goliath won in miserably, and in fact, <laughs> Philip Morris had to repay $7 million of legal fees to, to, uh, to uh, Uruguay. Real poetic justice, I would say. <laughs> And this was, uh, this was a first also for international arbitration, just in conclusion, that a international amicus brief of this variety was taken as sound evidence to arbitrate a case. Thank you, Douglas. And that's perhaps a role that WHO plays that many people are not that aware of and uh, that we need to give more visibility. Uh, talking about fighting Goliath, one does that uh, in a number of ways, and uh, you, Professor Zeltner, were involved before WHO started the work with the Framework Convention. Dr. Brundtland asked you to chair a committee on industry influence on the WHO itself. What led to this, and what were your results? Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me on the uh, platform here. And first of all, congrats for uh, what you did in your country. And let me just add one word here, and that is courage. It really takes a lot of courage to do what you did. It's, you know, building up political will is something, but uh, to then make this step and have the courage to counteract very strong opponents is remarkable. And. Um, Gro uh, Harman Brundtland, when she came into office, you know, right at the beginning, she said that uh, tobacco control is one of her priorities. And she was thinking of the framework convention right from the beginning. And apart from the point of courage, and I will add that, 
uh, it needs smart moves. And she was very smart realizing that she needs to understand how tobacco companies, particularly Philip Morris, and thanks to the US and to US courts had to open their files, had tried to undermine WHO's activities. And what she wanted to know uh, before starting um, activities within the house is to understand to what extent is actually WHO infiltrated by people paid or dependent from WHO. And so that she said, before I can start something, I need to be sure that WHO staff is integer, that there are no cases of corruption, etc. And to, then she asked an external committee to look into the documents of uh, uh, Philip Morris. Interesting point there too, she asked me to chair this committee. Um, I have, to, of course, to go back to my government and ask them whether they would agree on it. And they did. Even there were a little hesitations what should come out. And we then actually found a lot of uh, possible members for this committee who had to say no. We are not allowed to uh, sit in this committee, particularly from uh, so-called third uh, world countries. They said we, the, the risk we are running in getting on this committee are too big. So we uh, published this report and submitted it with a, a whole set of recommendations. The good news was that actually in the staff we didn't find really a lot of infiltration. We found some infiltration in some of the committees advising WHO. And we found that WHO has been way too loose when it comes to safety and security on all levels and particularly for the building. And looking at Tedros, if you have now difficulties um, getting into the building and the receive, uh, receiving uh, uh, guests, then you have to blame me because <laughs> we said, listen, you need to introduce security gates, you need to introduce uh, all these things because we figured out that actually tobacco industry was able to get into the building and just take whole files and walk out and nobody realized that. So um, that's uh, what I was asked to do and I think it was a very important step to start a new tobacco policy and to know where WHO stays uh, at that time. Thank you, Thomas. You mentioned that uh, you had to ask your government. Uh, can I just ask, I mean, this is a country with a strong presence uh, of the tobacco industry. Uh, did you feel pressure from tobacco uh, companies on Swiss health policies, on Swiss politics in general, perhaps even, when you were heading the Federal Office of Public Health? The answer is short, and sure, of course I did. <laughs> I mean, I think there is no, uh, no country where tobacco companies do not try to influence policies. And uh, one of the things uh, we realized with the report, and still is true, that there are like two avenues of trying to influence. There is what tobacco companies unfortunately actually copied from countries. They have their foreign policy, which is their lobbying activist activities, and they do have a whole set of secret service and front organizations, and you're dealing with them and you're not even sure uh, that, or you're not aware that these are um, allies or paid people by the uh, tobacco industry. So yes, I was constantly confronted with the lobbies, the foreign affair <laughs> part of uh, uh, tobacco and uh, their 
allies, which are normally in most countries uh, hotel and restaurant services, uh, advertising uh, groups, etc. And then I was confronted, of course, with what I would call the Secret Service. Thank you, Thomas. Douglas, one more uh, commentary from you. Uh, WHO, of course, and your responsibility at WHO includes a whole much broader range of non-communicable diseases and other commercial determinants, other areas. We talk now of sugar taxes, similar things. Uh, what can we learn from the tobacco story and how does WHO mobilize sectors beyond health to address exactly these commercial determinants and pressures that we have to deal with? So first of all, the importance of political commitment and President Vasquez, you've absolutely epitomized that, that extraordinary political commitment which is required to bring together the sectors required to mobilize a whole of government approach faced with this type of corporate espionage, um, the whole corporate strategy of, uh, of intimidating governments um, to institute a regulatory freeze. We've also seen this in plain packaging as well, too, which is also facing a similar dispute in the, uh, the World Trade Organization right now, which the tobacco uh, industry is playing some very untoward back, back uh, side uh, roles. Um, also, the, um, uh, the area which I lead, um, I was the coordinator for the negotiations of the Framework Convention, but now moved on to the broader prevention of, uh, of NCDs, including tobacco control. Uh, but what we've learned as well, too, is the importance of including leg uh, legal expertise in many areas of drafting regulations for the prevention and management of NCDs. Um, while uh, litigation is a common a business approach, commonly used as a weapon, as we've seen in the case against Uruguay, uh, countries shouldn't be intimidated by litigation. Instead, as Uruguay did, prepare yourself. Make sure you've got the best legal expertise. Make sure your laws and your regulations are as watertight as possible to prepare for the eventuality of potential challenges. Um, thirdly, I would say that um, health, giving the example and using the example of, uh, of Uruguay, that the health sector needs to extend its hand and understand trade and uh, deal with investment authorities, particularly uh, these bilateral investment treaties and investment treaties, what you, Alona, call the commercial determinants of health, um, to make sure that uh, when health uh, uh, experts are drafting public health policies, to make sure that investment treaties signed by their governments will not under, undermine the implementation of those public health measures, and vice versa, when health officials understand that a government, their government, is also uh, um, embarking on the negotiation of a new investment agreement, make sure that those public health protections are covered. And of course, multi-sectoral action, multi-sectoral coordination and cooperation important, but it's not just important that it occurs in, in name only. We really, in the same way that President Vasquez ensured in, in Uruguay, the sectors need to be aligned. They need to be moving in the same direction with the same common purpose. And also, international stakeholders like WHO, civil society, etc., should also make sure that they come to assist uh, countries in their times of need, especially in these cases where their sovereign rights to regulate for public health are being in, encroached upon. Um, examples of where we're walking the talk, uh, just next week our uh, trade, uh, trade lawyers in our department are going off to Uruguay. They'll be in Uruguay on the margins of a uh, tobacco control conference being held in Uruguay to uh, work with the countries of Americas on issues like investment uh, treaties, uh, um, and uh, trade issues relating to plain packaging uh, because plain packaging intersects to make it, plain packaging just to make it easy for everyone to understand is what Australia did first basically cutting off the logos, the pictures, the adornments of uh, a tobacco pack so it can no longer be used for advertising dece de uh, deceiving the public. Um, also likewise are we have a specialty uh, team working on tobacco uh, tax 
over 70 countries actually working in this area with ministers in finance. This is becoming more and more important now that countries are also asking for help in the areas of sugar sweetened beverages and will become even more important now that the Ending Childhood Obesity Implementation Plan was adopted by the World Health Assembly last week. Thank you, Doug. Mr. President, may I ask you another question? Uh, you have shown us uh, how many firsts there were in your country in relation to tobacco control. You've shown how to be a pioneer. You've shown what Thomas Zeltner has called political courage. You've now invited all countries, uh, all member states of the WHO to join you in October for the Montevideo Conference, which of course is dealing not only with tobacco, but uh, with a broad range of non-communicable diseases, preparing us uh, for the United Nations high-level meeting in 2018. Can I ask you how your experience uh, with tobacco control is giving you courage to address other non-communicable diseases in your country? Could you give us an example or two of that, please? <laughs> you can choose. Bien, alguna consideración previa. Me voy a referir a... I'm going to refer to the commercial aspects. Following the ruling of the CIA, the, w, the World Bank's uh, body, the, uh, the, uh, it was considered that the free trade agreements between countries or between countries and regions will not or better said, they should include that in that uh, investment protection agreements, uh, they do not include industries or investments which generate products which are harmful to health. I think that was one of the most important achievements which arises following this ruling. Because before, the Treaty on the Protection of Investments protected all investments, whether it was direct foreign, foreign direct investment or and it could allow for something which could be harmful to the health of the population. And these are no longer included in free trade agreements. Secondly, for this type of diseases, cancers or tobacco smoking, but then extending it on to other chronic NCDs, what we have to bear in mind from my very humble point of view is that parliaments can legislate. They can draw up the best laws with the best intentions, advised by the best uh, legal experts in each country. Or a president can issue a decree with the best of intentions and with the best advice possible for the benefit of the population. But if that law or that draft bill doesn't achieve political consensus and social consensus, they no doubt end up being filed away in a drawer. We have to include the participation of the population in this fight. The various organizations that are there, the education system, we have to start educating our children from a very early age. They are the best messengers. In order why they led to many homes no longer smoking, because the child, the little boy or girl, learnt at school from their teachers that smoking is harmful, and that if they smoke around them where the children are, they're going to be harmed. And what they learnt at school was taken home, and they'd say, Mommy, Daddy, don't smoke. You're harming me. And what greater power is there than a child asking his parent to not smoke because it's harming them? We have to have participation from 
civil, civil society organizations as well. It's not just a fight for governments, for politicians, for leaders. It is something that the whole po population has to take part in. And that, to me, most humbly seems that it's very important that we involve society. And to do that, we need to inform society. We have to carry out education for the whole population. When we're asked about the relationship or the levels of cancer in a country, uh, we think this, and we think this can be applied to all chronic NCDs. We think that countries can be divided into two groups, those which are oncologically developed and those which are underdeveloped in oncological terms. And what are the parameters for this classification into one or other group? The countries that are oncologically developed are those which, first of all, have very good educational programs on cancer for the population, which lead to an early and timely diagnosis or consultation. So people will go and talk to their doctor early on. Good education and prevention programs. Secondly, through this, they achieve a lower incidence of cancer because cancer can be avoided, but also the majority of the diagnoses take place in the early stages of disease. And so therefore, as a consequence, they cure more patients spending less and investing less. What happens to underdeveloped countries in terms of oncology? Generally, they don't have education programs, training programs, health promotion programs, programs that appear on the television, on the radio. They don't have these. Secondly, we diagnose cancer at later stages because people aren't educated, aren't ready. They don't go and talk to their doctor early enough. And then thirdly, we spend more money to cure fewer people. And this is dramatic. That's why I think education for prevention, for early diagnosis, the promotion of health, the educational tool throughout life at all levels is the main weapon we have against chronic NCDs. And it's at a very low cost. It's a low cost of investment. We don't need huge teams. We don't need major technology, uh, the latest electronic microscopes. We don't need all of that. We need to inform the population, educate them, allow them to participate in caring for their own health. And I think in that way, we're going to achieve very significant benefits for the whole population. At, the, at a meeting in the conference uh, in Montevideo, in coordination with the WHO, we are aiming to launch a roadmap which will set up and serve as a guideline for governments in all countries. Because not all governments are, have presidents as doc, who are doctors. We want to set this up so that we can work against these diseases, which can be reduced by 20 or 30 percent in a first stage. And if in a region that Latin America and the Caribbean, we have $50 million for the consequences, and if we think that instead of spending 10, 10 or 20 billion less than that 50 billion for these illnesses and the prevention, we can use those savings to better educate our people, to fight against poverty, to fight against marginalization. It's worth doing this, but it's a task we have to do together. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'm sure many of us uh, 
would wish there are many heads of state and heads of government that would speak out as strongly for health as you did right now. And maybe we can devise a program how we get there. That's why I vacated my chair. And Dr. Tedros has kindly agreed uh, to uh, also give us uh, a commentary on the issues that we have discussed. So uh, we will wait uh, for a minute. Uh, this does make it an all-male panel, uh, which uh, we don't normally do. Sit, please. please. I don't please. want to take your seat. <laughs> and uh, all right, we've just avoided it. Uh, please, Dr. Tedros, because the floor is yours. Taking somebody's seat is called what? Coup. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be better and. Uh, um, this way also I would like to just to express my respect, greatest respect and appreciation to His Excellency uh, President uh, Tabare Vasquez. So I would like to stand and address you. Uh, I actually had uh, with His Excellency the President my own time on Saturday. And I was so happy to meet His Excellency the champion. You know he was awarded uh, for his work on uh, smoke-free kids. Uh, and he is a real champion, and to have him among her, amongst us uh, today uh, really is a great uh, honor. So, muchas gracias, uh, Mr. President. Um, I would just like uh, to say uh, a few words uh, during our meeting on Saturday, uh, we had a very productive meeting, and we agree on all issues that he had raised uh, today, and I saw his commitment, and even more importantly, I saw his passion, so passionate. And I left energized and infected with his passion and commitment. So thank you so much for that, uh, Your Excellency. And also, he committed to help WHO, and I'm really grateful for that. He has been doing that, but he wants to do even uh, more. And then uh, we have discussed about uh, the upcoming conference in his beautiful country, Montevideo, Video, uh, and I hope many of us uh, will join, and I hope as many leaders as possible uh, could join. Uh, to be infected by his commitment and uh, passion. And then coming to the NCDs, uh, NCDs, as you know, account 63% of all deaths now. Uh, this is a lot. Uh, so this is a fight that we must fight. And the second reason that we need to fight is 80% of N NCDs or deaths due to NCDs occur actually in low and middle income countries. So this means it's a threat to the whole world and nobody is immune. And that is also a reason to fight this very important fight because it's a threat to the whole world. And number three, just he focused on tobacco because it's very important. Tobacco kills six million a year. And this will increase to 7.5 million by 2020. This is serious and we cannot really accept and we shouldn't accept. And now you know his reason to focus on tobacco. He has good reason. And that's why his fight is focused on tobacco, although his also a champion all, uh, on uh, all uh, NCDs. And it accounts 10% of the deaths. Uh, I was uh, really, I, I cannot tell you how um, sad and uh, worried I was when I visited many countries during the campaign. You see it in the streets, young, one, young women smoking in many countries. And obesity level high in the streets. This is a perfect storm, a storm that you don't see, a silent killer. And that's why it's, I said earlier, an important uh, fight. And then the illicit financing that he mentioned is very important. 
when the legal means is tackled, then there is a shift to illicit financing. And of course we have a protocol and you know only 22 countries had ratified it. And I hope the conference in Montevideo will, will really help us to increase the number of countries who would sign to the protocol or ratify the protocol significantly. And that is going to be very important and I'm glad he is championing and hope we will make uh, progress. The good news is NCDs are preventable, especially if we tackle the risk factors. And studies show that we can reduce by 34% if we can eliminate uh, the risk factors. For instance, 75% of heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. And then we can also prevent 40% of ca cancer by focusing on the risk factors. So it's in our hand. And as His Excellency the President said, the most important thing is to really transfer skills and knowledge to our people so they can live a healthy life. If you consider health as a product that can be produced by a person, if you give that person or family the right skills and knowledge, they can produce their own health. And when His Excellency spoke, that was how I understood. Let's give them the knowledge. Let's help them understand the risks. Let's have a grassroots movement, even mobilizing the civil society, with strong political commitment by the political leadership. And if our communities own it, then we can make big progress because health as a product can be produced by an individual if that individual has the right skills and knowledge and it becomes a choice whether to live a healthy life or otherwise. So that's a very important message and he summarized it. Apart from that, the political leadership commitment is important like what he's doing and focus on universal health coverage is important. But the universal health coverage, again, taking primary health care at the center of gravity. And for the primary health care to focus on health promotion and disease prevention. So the whole system focused on health promotion and disease prevention. And he suggested when also we met, our education curriculum should also reflect that. From childhood, Children should be taught a healthy lifestyle. So finally, the most important thing is a political commitment to do all this, a political commitment or a political intervention, because political intervention is surgical intervention. And it transforms us, be it social, political, or other transformations. Thank you, Your Excellency. And thank you also, Milona, for organizing this important meeting. And such a great honor to meet you. And uh, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. It was a great honor for us to have you here with us. It was a wonderful surprise we got this morning when we heard that you could join us. Thank you again, Your Excellency, Mr. President, for coming here and uh, showing us the difference that political commitment can make. And thank you to uh, Doug Betcher and Thomas Teltner for giving us some additional background and uh, commentary. Thank you to all of you for coming. And uh, it's a strong fight we need to fight uh, in society, in politics, uh, for legal action, for social action, for action to address the commercial determinants of health and to go to the UN General Assembly next year with a very strong program and very strong political support. And we have one of the leaders here with us. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you.